Hello. Good, uh, good afternoon. Uh, thank you very much uh, for the organizers for having me here to this very fascinating workshop. Uh, so I'm Elisa Modei. I'm an assistant professor at the Department of Network um, and Data Science at the Central European University. And um, so today we'll focus on, yeah, like somewhat uh, more specific <laughs> topic, I would say. Um, uh, so giving you uh, one example of how um, data-driven models can help us uh, monitor the SDGs. So the broader context um, of my talk uh, is this, uh, the realization uh, during the last, I would say more or less 15 years that um, a lot of this uh, new data that we are producing now on a daily basis uh, uh, using our phones, using the internet, but also through uh, all the satellite imagery, for example, that is available nowadays. Uh, so this data can be used beyond uh, uh, their original scope, and they have uh, started to be used uh, uh, by researchers uh, and by organi international organizations as uh, proxies to try and measure uh, socioeconomic indicators, for example, and things that uh, previously were uh, mostly uh, uh, only measured, uh, like traditionally through uh, surveys, uh, census data, et cetera. So uh, these, uh, these methods, such as survey census, et cetera, are still fundamental uh, for, uh, for assessing uh, socioeconomic indicators, but uh, we are nowadays also trying to figure out whether uh, some other kind of data can help us uh, whenever we are not, uh, we don't have first-hand uh, data available, right? And so, uh, over the years, uh, some of these data and methodology have been used uh, uh, to address uh, different kind of, uh, of questions uh, related to, the, uh, to sustainable development and to the SDGs in particular. There's a lot of work, for example, on estimating wealth uh, using satellite imagery, cell phone data, et cetera. Uh, uh, other works have focused on, for example, measuring gender inequalities or, uh, for example, um, measuring integration of immigrants in city, et cetera, just to give a few examples. But today, uh, I will focus on uh, SDG 2, so Zero Hunger, uh, which has been the focus of my work uh, in the last few years as I was uh, before transitioning back to academia again last year, I worked uh, for over two years at the World Food Program in Rome, and that's where uh, this work that I'm gonna present uh, started. So let's start with some uh, basic definitions. So food security uh, exists when uh, all people at all times have uh, physical as well as economic access to uh, sufficient, safe, and nutritious food. So. Uh, it's about availability of food, but also uh, people being able to access it, right? And when these conditions are not met, uh, then we say that a population uh, in a given area at a given time is food insecure. And just to give you a few numbers, uh, in 2021, uh, the estimate was that there were almost 200 million acutely food insecure people around the world in across 53 countries from Latin America to Sub-Saharan Africa to, um, to Asia, and then also uh, recently, uh, uh, more recently, uh, even more so even in Eastern Europe with the war and all. And these numbers are actually uh, growing. So uh, back in 2016, there were uh, around 100 million people. So as you can see, this, the number has practically almost doubled uh, within uh, a six, uh, uh, within six years, basically. Of course, the pandemic uh, didn't help <laughs> to make things better. Um, so this is not only a big problem, but also a complex one, so a complex phenomenon. So just to, uh, yeah, like to, to give you an idea, uh, food security experts, they try to characterize uh, food insecurity uh, by the main drivers. and. Three main drivers uh, have been identified. So uh, one is conflict and physical insecurity. Then, of course, there's more and more weather extremes, and then uh, economic shocks as well. Um, so, but although uh, basically, yeah, like in every region, there is a main driver that is trying, like that is being identified. Actually, what we see is that, um, like, 
many most food crises are the result of multiple drivers and of uh, like inter uh, like combinations so how these uh, these different uh, drivers from weather to economic shock and conflict how they also um, basically interact right um, so uh, this uh, this said like how do we uh, measure food insecurity so several um, indicators have been developed uh, across the years by FAO the World Food Program etc and uh, basically, uh, most of them uh, look at the diversity of dietary intake of households and uh, also at the consequences of constrained access to food. And the indicators that I've uh, focused on are the food consumption score, measuring the, the former, and the reduced coping strategy index, measuring the latter. So, food consumption score basically is measured by uh, interviewing households and asking them in the last seven days how often did you eat food from different uh, food, uh, food categories, right? From staples to fruits to uh, dairy products. And each of these categories has a nutritious um, uh, value. Uh, these values uh, um, often depend also on the country. So this is a general methodology that is applied in several countries, but at the same time, uh, depending on the region, you, you have different uh, values for the weight that this uh, food groups have, and then basically through this frequency, you you build a um, weighted uh, weighted sum to uh, then get a final score that allows you to classify households in uh, three different uh, groups, having poor food consumption, borderline food consumption, or acceptable one. So this is the first uh, uh, kind of indicator, and um, another very important measure is okay. I might have access or not to food, but then like what are sort of the consequences of me not having access to food for uh, like some time and how do I cope with this? So uh, another kind of question that is often asked is how in the last seven days, how often did you have to rely on the following coping strategy? So how often did you have to borrow food from family or friends or uh, to limit portion size at the meal time, uh, restrict consumption by adults in order for small children to eat, etc. And here also you have different levels of severity for each of these strategies and then you sum uh, them up in a weighted manner, this frequency in a weighted manner to uh, come up with a score for each household of how, uh, how insecure they are in terms of coping strategies. And um, in order to collect these information, there's, uh, uh, as I was saying, traditionally several ways to do it, like the more uh, traditional one are face-to-face -face assessments, uh, such as the comprehensive food security and vulnerability analysis uh, that are normally carried out uh, around uh, twice a year, but then also in the last, um, let's say, less than 10 years, uh, some new uh, new ways relying on mobile phones, for example. So now, in, even in sub-Saharan Africa, there's quite uh, a high penetration of mobile phones, at least the sort of old style ones. And so it's possible to carry out this kind of, um, of surveys uh, also re remotely so that you can make many more surveys in less time and spending less money. And uh, for example, WFP has been carrying out uh, these uh, surveys on a daily basis in over 35 countries, uh, basically starting uh, five years ago and then increasing the, the number of areas uh, where they are actually doing these surveys um, uh, now. So then you collect all this data at a household level and then what you do is that then you aggregate, of course, you, you need to have like a, a statistically significant number uh, of, uh, of surveys per, uh, per area and per time window. Uh, and then basically what you do, you look at all your households. Uh, most times then households are also weighted uh, in order like there's some post certification um, methods carried out in order to, uh, to make sure that uh, you are accounting for actually uh, the, uh, like the, the characteristics of the populations. And then basically you can uh, measure the prevalence of people that have insufficient food consumption by looking at all those households that have uh, um, poor or uh, borderline food consumption. And then also the prevalence of people using crisis or above crisis uh, food-based coping by basically selecting those that have an uh, RCA score greater than a given threshold. Uh, so, 
This is nowadays done uh, in many places, uh, very often. But still, like, the question remains, like, we cannot really do this right at all places at all time. It's still time consuming, it's expensive, etc. So. Um, the, the question that, uh, that I was posed when I joined the workshop program was, can we actually use secondary information, data from all these new, relatively new sources, and these uh, methods uh, from data science, machine learning, et cetera, to actually uh, give an estimate, give a sort of prediction of what the food insecurity situation is, of like an estimate of these indicators for areas where we don't have up-to-date uh, uh, primary data. And so, uh, in order to do this, of course, the first thing that we did was to uh, resort to, uh, like, we went to the <laughs> food security experts. Uh, there were a lot in house, of course. And uh, so let's look at what the causes are. And I mentioned this uh, earlier. So there are three main causes that uh, experts identify. Of course, they are not, uh, there's many more. Let's think about, uh, for example, uh, animal diseases, uh, crop diseases, health emergencies, of course. Uh, but these are like the three main ones. And so the first thing that we did was to start building uh, a, a database as wide as possible in or that would uh, put together and harmonize all this kind of data to, uh, to start building our models. So for example, for conflict information, we resorted to the Athlete project where basically they, um, they collect on a weekly basis daily news uh, from all around the world about conflict and they are able to extract also the number of fatalities involved in this conflict, categorize the conflicts, etc. Uh, then uh, we uh, also resorted to a variety of uh, uh, microeconomic indicators uh, such as food and headline inflation, currency uh, exchange rates, etc. as well as uh, things that WFP collects uh, itself like market prices, so what are the prices of different commodities in uh, local markets um, across the world. And then finally, on the weather side of things, we resorted to uh, data coming from, as I was mentioning, like the satellites that basically provide for every 10 days new measures of the status of the vegetation, how much it rained, and then you can, like having collected data uh, now for uh, over 30 years, you can also look at uh, anomalies with respect to uh, the average, for example, rainfall of vegetation, uh, greenness in that same area in that same period of time. And so see if actually things are worse or better. And so we created this uh, database. Uh, it's not a static one in the sense that we wanted to build a model, model that then could run in near real time. So basically this, this is a, a database that updates it, uh, itself uh, every evening or whenever, every night or whenever there's like the, there's new data available. And we also wanted to build something that only relied on open source uh, and frequently uh, updated uh, um, data so that, you know, like we could build like a sort of sustainable system in the sense that uh, the system could run over time, like even in the long term. And then basically what we did, uh, we had uh, a set of also of training data, so uh, thousands of data points on the prevalence of people with insufficient food consumption and the prevalence of people using crisis or above crisis food-based coping strategies. And uh, so we had this information for several areas around the world. I don't know if you can see the resolution, but basically what we look at is the first level administrative units. Uh, across country, and so we have this for hundreds of uh, different uh, first level administrative units uh, around the world and at different points in time. So this is our uh, training set. And then, so we associate for each area at each time, we associate the value of the different kind of indicators that I was mentioning uh, before, economic, weather, and conflict uh, indicators. And when available, we also look at what was the, the last measure prevalence. So we, we then, as I was saying, this is a complex problem for which we don't really have a mechanistic <laughs> model of how uh, things work. So we, we went for a uh, data-driven approach. We used a state-of-the-art te machine learning techniques. I'm not going to go into the details now, of, but we, of course, like uh, tune deep parameters uh, with some feature selection, etc. Um, and what we 
obtained uh, was uh, were models. So we have actually two models uh, for each of the two indicators that uh, that I mentioned. Uh, a model for places where uh, where we like a model when we only use secondary information, and a model where we also look uh, like take into account the last available measurement for that area. And then we uh, we basically also. Uh, tested this model uh, since, of course, like when you include the, the last measure prevalence, you you already uh, you, you obtain quite some uh, high scores. Uh, and you, of course, you might wonder, well, is it because it's you can simply use that and you will get a good enough uh, right uh, metric for what's happening right now? Well, actually, uh, food security is a quite uh, dynamic uh, process. So. Uh, what we, we looked at was a baseline model when we only used the last available uh, prevalence as uh, our predictive variable, and we see uh, that actually the, um, our like, results using also all these other dimensions uh, perform much better than just this uh, naive approach. And uh, one important thing once we trained and tested our model was uh, to actually look at uh, explanations, right? Because um, in a decision-making context in general, uh, you, it's not only important to make a predictions, prediction are oft, often not uh, <laughs> accurate as you, like, um, as you need them, et cetera. And so you need to also provide um, the users of the model with uh, some um, concrete ways to, to understand what, where the, the predictions come from so that they can uh, understand uh, why you obtain this number and then also make sort of a, um, an assessment themselves of if things, uh, you know, make sense or not, or if there's, what are the elements that are worth exploring more. So we've started by using uh, uh, shop values, um, just to give you an idea of, of what, are, what is the contribution of each uh, independent variables compared to uh, a broad average. Uh, but then uh, what we did after that was to actually look at differences uh, in shop values because what we have um, is a static model, right? So we have, we want to predict, uh, let's say, um, the food security situation for a given area uh, today, this month. And so we use data, secondary data about that area. Um, of course, use like data, for example, about the last three months, et cetera. And then we make one prediction. But then we run this model every day or like as soon as some of the input variable changes so that we can actually also look how things uh, change over time. But it's not an intrinsically dynamic model. For now, it's just uh, a static model that you run every day. But then what's interesting actually for uh, to look at is when the model actually predicts a change, right? So until you can see here some, like most of, uh, of our prediction of this kind of, of steps. So until one day you, you get this value and then from uh, tomorrow the day after you, you have an increase um, in, in the prediction, let's say. So a deterioration of the food security situation. And so we actually use sub values differences to try to understand what are the variables that play a role in this change, and this is really what interests the decision makers, so that they can make an assessment whether it's worth, uh, you know, like exploring this further. So the idea is not to provide a number that then decision maker should just take and uh, um, as the ultimate route, of course, but just to to give them a tool uh, to to say, okay, these are the things that you need to be uh, looking at. Like uh, our model, for example, uh, like this is the 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 variable that has changed a lot and also has had an impact on the, on the prediction, for example. Now, finally, this, this uh, another, um, a very important part of the, of the work was actually to operationalize this model. So uh, the, the whole point, so this started more like with this idea in mind. So this was what was the initial ideas by, um, by the managers, uh, uh, at Workflow Program, they wanted a platform like this where you had this world map and you could click here and there and get uh, estimates of the food security situation. Um, and so this is a publicly available website uh, that is updated to a thing on a daily basis. And then when you click on a country, if in this country there is a continuous data collection, you will see uh, the numbers coming from, from, 
from the, let's say, let's call them actual data. Um, and then where in other countries, uh, you will see uh, the predictions that uh, come uh, from uh, our model. So basically uh, the prediction of the prevalence uh, and then transforming number of people with insufficient food consumption and the number of people who's in crisis or above crisis uh, food-based coping. Now, let's go to the challenges and invitations, which is <laughs> usually, uh, I would say, the, the most interesting part, also to, <laughs> to spark some more discussions on where we could go. So, one of the big, uh, um, yeah, uh, limitations is also critique that we received was like, why, why are you building a global model? Like, we are putting all these different uh, areas together into one box and then uh, train our models using all of this. Uh, whereas a local approach could give you more nuances, right, on what's really going on. Uh, so the, um, this, of course, like, uh, so the, the main problem is an operational one. So basically, the idea is that since we, uh, we need the model mostly for places also where we don't have that much data, so we're not able to train a model only for those places because these are precisely the places for which we don't have uh, a lot of data. And so, but so this means that there's a lot of limitations. So we, we actually had more data than the ones that we use, but then they were, uh, for example, most of it was for Yemen and Syria. And then if we would only use that to make predictions then for a sub-Saharan uh, African country, of course, that would not work. So we had to uh, sample the data uh, we know that our mo uh, model is, is not that uh, sense, like it's, uh, there's a smaller sensitivity to local patterns than to a uh, more global one. And then of course, the transferability to geographical context that are not included in the training data is of course not uh, guaranteed. So this, this needs to be of course something to, to keep in mind while using this kind uh, of models. Then. Uh, another challenge was, as I mentioned earlier, the, the fact of finding, uh, you know, open data that were available on a global scale at the same geographical and temporal resolution. Uh, we, uh, so the data that we have is all open data. Uh, it's not at the same <laughs> geographical and temporal resolution. Some, some is daily, some is monthly, some is weekly. Um, and also some is national, some is subnational, but then so a lot of the work was also to put all of this together and, and find ways to uh, integrate this uh, in the model. And then finally, as I said, uh, of course, uh, these predictions are not meant to trigger decision making, uh, but rather to, to trigger further assessment uh, of the situation. So uh, I don't know, like this is actually something to, I find as an interesting question, like is it just a matter of getting to more and more precise models or will it always, should it always be the case actually that when you deal with this kind of systems, I think there should always be probably, uh, yeah, like um, this sort of human step when uh, in decision making and these models should probably just be used as tools uh, for decision makers to uh, to get some early warning or to, you know, trigger further um, uh, in-depth analysis. And then in terms of future directions, and this is really something where I, I'd love to hear more about uh, your inputs uh, over the next few days, is, uh, so as I said at the beginning, we're using a purely data-driven approach, right? So we, we throw all these uh, variables from uh, different drivers, um, but is there a way to actually, uh, I don't know, go about this complex uh, phenomenon uh, and still come up with a quantitative uh, output, but that uh, uh, maybe has a bit more of a mechanistic component. So how can we actually combine these uh, two approaches, I, I would say, or even more than two probably, uh, a bit in a way, I would say that probably in the, the field of uh, um, computational epidemiology or like epidemic spreading, they have been able so far to, to maybe um, combine the two uh, a bit more. So can we do this also in other fields such as uh, uh, the field of food insecurity or this, this other kind of, uh, of phenomena? So that would be sort of my, what <laughs> I would love to do uh, in the future. And that I hope uh, is one of the things that this workshop can also uh, bring 
uh, more like insights on how, how to combine these uh, sort of two worlds. Uh, so in the interest of time, I think, so these were the main things I wanted to tell you. Well, this is all in this preprint, but uh, I would suggest to hold on <laughs> to, to, like if you're interested, wait, uh, because we are actually, there's a new version coming soon. The article has finally been accepted for publication. So we're gonna update also the preprint just in a couple of weeks. And also the methodology has changed a bit. Uh, so this was posted like a year ago. So in the meantime, thanks to the also reviewers input, we, um, we have made a few improvements. So this will be available soon. Uh, there's also follow-up work that I've been doing also with the colleagues at ISA Foundation in Turin on, uh, so what I talked about until now is to predict, estimate the current situation, but then the question is also, okay, actually in areas where we do uh, add data, such as, um, as I mentioned, Yemen or Syria, where really daily data have been collected, uh, uh, data has been collected on a daily basis for now, like uh, almost, uh, four or five years. So in these places, can we actually use this uh, time series to go from just now casting to actually to forecast how the situation is likely uh, to evolve in these places? Um, not, and then uh, one other thing that uh, I'm very interested in, as I said earlier, but yeah, like, so I come more from, uh, uh, I, I like originally was trained in physics and I have like my master in physics of complex systems. So that's really the, 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 the kind of methodology that uh, inspire me the most. And so recently we, uh, I wrote a piece with colleagues at UNICEF and at ISA Foundation on uh, sort of what are the current um, applications of uh, complex system science, complexity science uh, for the most vulnerable. So again, like for sort of uh, monitoring, addressing the SDGs. And uh, we outlined there a few success stories, but also discussed a lot sort of challenges and limitations and future opportunities of this. Um, so this is also something I might think to discuss in the next uh, few days. And we also organize uh, a workshop every year at the conference on complex systems. Uh, so the next one is going to uh, take place uh, in Palma de Mallorca in, uh, in October uh, of this year. So if you are uh, at the conference, uh, I hope to see you also uh, at the workshop at the satellite. Okay, thank you very much and have some discussion. Well, thank you, Lisa, this was great. So um, I have a question myself. So um, first uh, in the slide where you, where you show this transition, um, uh, in your food insecurity index, so um, is is I mean, can you trace then what happened at that point in time? So yes, yeah. so basically here, so we are, as I was saying, so the these are what happens is that from one week to the next, uh, mostly what you can see here from the the, the picture, like so this 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 is uh, this tells you what the, the input features that are responsible for this change are. And so here what it seems is that basically uh, food inflation went up. And so this in the model caused uh, a deterioration in situation, an increase in the number of food insecurity people. Uh, food prices. Uh, yeah, and then uh, also another, and whereas at the same time this, this was slightly counterbalanced by uh, uh, rainfall uh, being uh, actually, uh, uh, yeah, being going more towards normality, but still not enough uh, for, yeah. So basically it was mostly uh, about food prices, yes. Okay, okay, so, um, okay. And, so, the, and this is yeah. just an example, of course, like you can create this kind of figures for any of the countries where we run the model and then you will it will allow you to, to understand why you see that change, basically. Thank you. Thank you for the interesting talk. I was wondering if in your model you also consider the adaptive capacity of a society. So how do they, they can they react, or individuals or uh, of a society itself, how can they react to this food insecurity? Is this something that you can consider? Because it's also important 
uh, whether like they, this, they, they have a shock, but how do, can, they, can they react? Do they have, or whether it's migration, whether they are going to do something, though, would you consider this as well? Mm, no, not really, not uh, explicitly. I would say that, so one of the two indicators that we measure is their, uh, like how they cope with uh, insufficient food availability, but so that's, uh, but it's not, yeah, it's not something that we explicitly take into account. Uh, um, I don't know exactly how you would uh, measure that, but uh, that would be very interesting, yeah, to, to explore that. Thank you. I had a question about the question that you ask your informants about food sharing. So when they have food insecurity, how often do you borrow food or rely on help from friends or relatives? So for a lot of small scale societies, food sharing is just a normal part of day to day life. So how do you tease out whether that is I have insufficient food and I need to borrow this or just have help? versus a norm in the society that someone will, who has more, even if it's just a little bit, is going to share with everyone. Right, um, so I don't know the details to, to like a detailed answer to your question, um, but what I know is that when they do this kind of surveys, so first of all, these are done, uh, like I put here, sort of like the English translation of what like that, is valid for everyone, but each of these surveys actually done in the local language and uh, sort of, um, yeah, customized for the local context. So I would assume that in, in societies uh, such as those you described, the question would be phrased uh, slightly uh, different. Um, and, then, and then maybe also what I would think is that if you, um, if you interview uh, large enough sample of your population and you see the, that consistently sort of everyone has to try and borrow food or, um, or actually come up with uh, different coping strategies, then you would, uh, this would mean that actually there is a problem for everyone, right? Like, so I, I guess it's also a matter of that. But I, uh, also, I think, yeah, the, the most important point is that when these questions are asked in the local language and in the local context, they probably have different declinations of it. Oh. Thank you very much. Um, two points. I, I, I read that as Fields Medal Manual. I thought, great. But anyway, that's an aside. So the, um, no, just to the uh, two, a question and a comment on the question at the back. Presumably, right, you have periods of time where your prevalence index is variably, is reasonably invariant, but your underlying factors are variable, right? So that would be, in some sense, a measure of adaptive capability, right? The invariance to variation in your primary factors. So I guess that's in the data that you could look at that. Right. Right. But no, but, but my question was, it, it connects to Luisha's um, talk, because this is exactly the kind of thing that Luisha was alluding to at the end as a signal of aggregate, you know, behavior. And the question then becomes, does anyone actually attend to any of these things? In other words, you have all these fancy dashboards that you showed <laughs> us. Does anyone actually care? <laughs> So does, do, do policymakers look at them and make decisions, or is this just a lot of money spent on graphics? I'm just curious to know. So, well, what, um, how this is used within WFP. Uh, so actually, so there is the, 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 the website, uh, but then also from the same data and models, uh, like a sort of automatic report is generated uh, uh, on a weekly basis, um, and we, like, summarizing uh, all the main results and looking like giving numbers for each country. Um, and then this is sent uh, every Friday, uh, well, sorry, every, yeah, every, let's say, during the weekend uh, to the, the members uh, of the board, uh, um, the advisory board uh, of WFP, who meet on Monday morning uh, with this information at hand. So then, um, like the idea here, so what, what uh, 
I've seen uh, in my times there was that uh, this is seen as a, a useful tool uh, at um, HQ level, right? So uh, where you get a bit of a sense uh, overall of what's the situation in the different countries and if there's any country where uh, we need to, to, to take a look more closely. Uh, and I mean, when this, again, just to, to underline it, it's a combination, like these reports and the hunger map, they are a combination of the, the data that is collected on a daily basis and the predictions. So uh, I would say that right now uh, people still, of course, trust more the, the, the data that is being collected, uh, which makes a lot of sense, of course. Uh, but yeah, so in general, um, it's considered, like it's, it's a tool that is looked at at HQ level, whereas the uh, individual countries and uh, field offices, they don't find it as useful because for them on a local level, of course, they, they, they claim that they have much more information <laughs> than what goes into, of course, the model and, uh, um, and the data collection, which, as I was saying, is done more of a first level administrative unit, whereas uh, you often need more localized uh, uh, information, right? To, and uh, ch things change also more locally. So there is still, a, I think, a bit of, uh, there, we need to bridge <laughs> this gap about different uh, geographical scales. Um, but um, it seems that H at HQ level, this is sort of, uh, yeah, like at least looked at on a weekly basis, which I find already as a, <laughs> uh, for me personally, uh, um, yeah, yeah, good uh, good indication so far of that we are going in at least in the right direction. We are not building this just, uh, yeah, as you were saying, just to build fancy dashboards. <laughs> but definitely there's more work that needs to be done there in order. So, so I think this issue is uh, really interesting. So what is the right scale to, to see a particular phenomenon? Because essentially if you are the too large scale, you can essentially average out uh, what is going on. And I think this is connected to what uh, Luis was saying. I personally don't believe uh, <laughs> what you said, so you have to convince me. But uh, I think also coming to the model part, uh, I mean, connecting this to the model, I mean, somehow this was uh, sounding a little bit like uh, uh, missing uh, uh, this issue of poverty traps. In which, which I mean, this has been studied. I mean, a part is expert about this. So, when is it that the level of uh, calories that you intake uh, make uh, your uh, make it impossible for you to get a, I mean, a, a revenue, and then there is a positive feedback uh, so that you you fall in these poverty traps. And uh, yeah, th so this is supposed to be integrated into this indicator. So when we see, look at this threshold here, et cetera. This is something that has been developed by food security analysts and this threshold have been probably. Um, is there some evidence of this uh, positive feedbacks? I mean, in, that you can see in the data? Uh, no, I, like, I don't, that's not something we really looked into yet, yeah. But yeah, something have to Are explore there, more. If there are no other questions, then. Uh, we have a coffee break upstairs, and maybe we can uh, reconvene. Uh, in, uh,